thank you so much for joining us. We are here today. Uh, this panel is called <laughs> um, Mi Voz Beyond the Documentary, Fiction Filmmaking as Advocacy. And today we have so many <laughs> awesome panelists. I'm going to start with Daniel. Can you please introduce yourself and your, um, your craft? Hi, my name is Daniel de Jesus. And I think like many people here in this panel, I'm a, a multidisciplinary artist. I am primarily known for being a musician and a composer. And I definitely write uh, music for, you know, both performing albums and I've written for film. Um, but I'm also uh, in an, an amazing adventure right now of working on um, production for a animated short called Alex of the Labyrinth. That is a a uh, docu short in which we are um, collecting and investigating information from different community members on their experience with COVID-19 and specifically the Latinx community and turning that into a fictional retelling of Alice in Wonderland that takes place in Philadelphia under COVID fog. So definitely looking forward to um, sharing a little bit more about that, but that's um, all about me. Do you want me to popcorn it over to somebody? Please do. I'll just popcorn it over to uh, Les because I've worked with Les before. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, hola, hello. My name is Les Rivera. I am a writer, director, filmmaker. I recently completed a feature film called Papi Ramirez versus Giant Scorpions that I filmed inside of a rental storage unit. Uh, I threw up a green screen in there and it was a one man band or a Juan, which is my middle name, Juan man band film, because <laughs> I did everything. I acted in it. Um, I did all the uh, the sets were miniatures. The props were miniatures. Um, there was stop animation. So it was a very, very fun film to make and something that I want to continue to explore. So I sort of have become like a bit of an expert when it comes to like miniatures and green screen and incorporating actors into those kinds of scenes. So that's that's pretty much what I do. And uh, yeah, I have a really good time doing it. Um, I am going to pass it over to Gabe. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I'm Gabe Castro, uh, you, she, and they pronouns. And I uh, am also uh, a multimedia producer and creator, all kinds of things I'm up to. Um, but what I'm primarily known for is working at Philly Cam, uh, which is what this wonderful panel is a part of our People Power Media Fest. So I work in our public access station um, as a member programming manager, helping uh, the community of filmmakers in Philadelphia create content that means something to them and amplifying their voices. And then I am also the producer and co-host of The Ghouls Next Door, which is a horror media literacy show where we, <laughs> thank you, uh, where we, you know, dissect media and, you know, talk about its impact on our cultures and communities, and then also unpack just some of the the themes that they cover in there so that's a big part of it um and then i also do sound design for black women are scary so i'm going to pop it over to Wimoto, uh <laughs> so she can talk more about that hello everyone i'm Wimoto naoka i'm a writer and producer i'm the founder of dusky projects and we make genre works in audio theater and short media content uh so what Gabe was talking about is our podcast currently in its third season called Black Women Are Scary, where we produce uh, short horror stories by BIPOC authors. And we're also on WPB 88.1 FM Friday nights at 10. So you can hear it there or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And I, I don't want to talk too much about, um, I know there's going to be some time afterwards to talk about projects and things that we're doing. So I'll, I'll, you know, wait until then. Uh, should I popcorn? I see lots of people here on my gallery view, but I'm not sure. Just pick somebody to pop a corner to or. Oh, that's it. That's it. Okay, and we were just back to you, Eunice. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So we were just introducing our panelists. Um, 
everyone. My name is Eunice Levi. I am a writer and director, um, Philadelphia, greater Philadelphia area. And I also focused on um, genres. Uh, I love genre. Um, and I, I tend to do a lot of social advocacy in my work. So this is a really, really special panel for me. Thank you, Philly Cam and uh, Philadelphia Latino Film Festival and People Power Media Fest for this opportunity. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Let's let's talk about fiction versus nonfiction and using genre um, to talk about um, social issues. Um, what is your preference? Like, what do you guys as artists, do you lean on fiction, nonfiction? How do you determine how you're going to use your voice? And we can start with, with Daniel. We can go in the same way if you'd like. Okay, sure. Um, <clears throat> I I feel like um, uh, fiction is uh, an amazing tool that I've been able to use to um, investigate things that are in in the real world, uh, specifically in some of the work that I've I've done, and especially in this, you know, in the production of this project. Uh, a lot of the things that we're doing are based on um, actual research, interviews, collecting people's stories, and kind of using the fictional aspect to bring light to those stories and to make them available. And I think that um, I, I've often seen them as working hand in hand. Um, and I always think about um, works like uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair mm. or works like um, uh, Gulliver's Travels, you know, these incredible fictional works that um, are much better at delivering uh, a message of uh, related to real life, you know, social issues and social ills and or, um, you know, issues around justice. So I feel like there are um, lots of opportunities to use fiction as a tool and for it to touch documentary. Um, uh, you know, things that are that live in documentary, you know, filmmaking, and some might argue that documentaries are sometimes fictional. So <laughs> um, I think that that's uh, it, it, uh, there's a lot of play there, um, and it's I think it's how it's delivered. But I'm sure um, other folks have a lot of wonderful um, insight to that as well. Yeah, um, love that. Did you want to jump in or or gay? Um, for me, uh, similar to what Daniel has said, but, um, for me personally, I feel like I need to not just go with fiction, but I have to use comedy in some of the works that I make, because if not, it's just too painful. So it's a way to kind of balance, um, you know, difficult subjects. And I also feel as though it gives me an opportunity to to like weirdly bring more emotion than if it was a straight ahead drama. I feel like there's so much emotion and drama and comedy that, it, you know, it, I, I just, I don't know if I could make a piece of work that didn't include it. So definitely fiction and comedy is the way that I, I like to go with when I create my work. Yeah, I think um, fiction work is really powerful. And I think it, it doesn't get enough credit for, you know, like we, we put so much stock into, you know, nonfiction and documentary work, and there's, you know, total space for that. And there's amazing work in that space. Um, but oftentimes, we kind of just see it as not having any motives or like, <laughs> you know, being free of any influence, right, which is just impossible as any creator will know it touches too many hands to not have some type of focus or um, desire, whereas with fiction, it's like you could just flat out <laughs> tell the story that you want to tell. Um, and it, it is really powerful. I mean, our my entire job is talking about how um, amazing fiction like creativity is in talking about certain things that maybe we don't have the words to say or like in a in a compelling way that is digestible for for more audiences and um 
it, it kind of breaks down those barriers, especially like comedy. Um, we are always putting comedy in there and comedy has that similar um, tension and release that like horror also has, which is why I really lend towards uh, those, the specific genre works too, is just that I think we we come in with a certain certain walls up or certain expectations with nonfiction work that when we're with fiction, we can kind of let those things loose because we're just like, oh, we're here to enjoy something. And then afterwards, we're like, whoa, I feel all these things. I have like inspired or motivated or I'm crying, <laughs> you know, like what's going on. Um, and it's just a, a unique way of storytelling. And again, I think it just gets it it doesn't get as much respect sometimes for um, being serious and being uh, a tool for uh, impacting our communities and, and telling our stories in that way. I see a lot of bleeding actually between the two. There's a lot of documentaries that use fiction storytelling devices or structures to get their point across or just even just in the, in the format of their work. And the same thing with fiction, you know, like I'm thinking of once upon a time, there was no such thing as a mockumentary. And now almost all shows, <laughs> so many shows use mockumentary as a way of, you know, delivering this humor and telling the truth about something, but also making you laugh like a way in. You, you know, it's not real, but it's filmed as though it is real. Or it's like, I mean, reality TV in general, just as a genre is an interesting nexus of you know, for better, or for worse, where both of those things are happening at the same time. Uh, so I don't know if they're, if it's really so much about like one versus the other necessarily. It's just that I'm, I do horror and sci-fi. I'm committed to that genre. And I like it because I get to like make up rules and I don't, <laughs> like, that's why I like it. I just get to world build and make up rules and not necessarily pay attention to what like to reality, quote unquote. Um, and so I gravitate towards fiction work, uh, but there are definitely things about documentary filmmaking that I like and might one day find myself using even in my fiction work. I agree, I agree. I think that there's also this, this really um, robust history that we can use in our fiction. Like for example, when they see us, um, that was based on a true story. Um, I'm going to think of all Ava DuVernay now because that's all that's in my mind, but um, Selma, the 13th, like all of these things that are not necessarily a documentary, but they are based on real events. And then we expand it. And I think that it's a way of not necessarily, it's, it's a way of revisiting a history that was erased or that at the time, the voices of the people that were going through it were marginalized. And so they didn't have a, a voice. Um, so it, it also allows the creator to give a voice to those that are underserved, um, which I, I really love about um, fiction work. Les, do you wanna, do you wanna jump in and ask or do you want me to continue? Why don't you continue and I'll do the next one. <laughs> you got it. How do you guys, it, it, just along those lines, um, and I'm jumping around, of course, but how do you guys feel about like docudramas, like combining the traditional format of creative storytelling and then like reenactments? Like, do you think that that's a, 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 an effective way of, of kind of uh, meshing together two genres? Or do you think it's an effective way of, of um, getting the same notoriety that let's say Game of Thrones or something very highly, you know, fictionalized. Um, what do you guys think? Um, I'm an art history nerd besides being someone that works in mixed media. And I, I, I tend to cringe when I see dramatizations of, of artists' lives. Um, but um, I also see that it's a tool where you know it can really kind of uh, give people an insight into um, a world that um, is very complex and multi-layered, and I think sometimes that dramatization of something that is documented, you know, like what, like uh, so. So when I was thinking about different projects that I've been working on, um, it's often trying to take things that are based in you know the documentary piece itself is is 
is part of the of the of the project it's part of the film but it we then want to make those stories more directly available and so it's it's then you know expanding it into different places online where people can watch an interview or they can read something and then they can kind of um expand the you know the world that we've created into you know the resources and sharing the resources that um you know were used for for the project and um i think that when uh something is 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 dramatized i I think I understand the, I think it depends on what it is, but I think it, I think uh, what's happening is that there's um, a focus on a story and a focus on maybe certain characters that we then fall in love with surrounded, kind of cloaked by the historical context. And so I think it's really hard to, I think it can be very challenging to mesh the two together in that context and in that way. I understand the motivation. I personally, I tend to, feel drawn away from that but um i'd be super interested in to hear to hear what uh, our other folks uh, think and, and what their experience has been can i kind of pass this on because i feel very similar to daniel i don't have anything to add to that gabe you're on <laughs> I can go. all right i got it um yeah i so it, similarly uh there's a bit of where I really enjoy a blending of, of genres, like in, in different ways. Like I love like a little dash of animation or like, you know, just the ways that we're uh, approaching in storytelling and storytelling and not sticking to like, you know, stoic ways that we do things. But I agree that there's, there are certain topics or um, issues where I feel like there isn't always consideration of those who are affected or involved or um, like there's so much work that goes into documentary storytelling of just ensuring that people feel comfortable and safe telling certain stories and so if we're also like dramatizing them and, and in in a way it can kind of take away the realness of it too sometimes um, so real I think it really depends on what is being told so like for certain uh, you know true crime, things like without uh certain family members or victims who are you know being vocal about their experiences and having some way in on that like if they're okay right like versus something like when they see us where you know it's done with this care um and with very specific intentions um to make this story something that people can really connect to in a way that maybe they wouldn't have gravitated towards if it were a documentary. Um, I still haven't seen it because it's, I'm like, trigger warning for myself. Um, <laughs> so like, but that's just the power of it. Like I know, like even though it is a, you know, it's a dramatized version of reality, it's still too real that I was just like, that's really close to it. And it's the same way as like, like certain documentaries I just won't watch because of that same idea. Um, so I think it really depends on the the content. Um, in some places it really shines and adds to it and can really make it uh, easier to understand or relate or empathize with. And then in other ways you're like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, is everyone cool with that? Cause this doesn't sit right with me. Um, and that, usually it's like certain people that we're, we're highlighting where I'm like, oh, let's check back on that one. <laughs> so and it, I, it's kind of different than <laughs> what we were saying. You know, I really feel like it just comes down to, and it's the same across the board, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, who is telling the story at the end of the day all the time with any kind of anything that you're using, special effects, non, no special effects, practical effects, docudrama, you know, are you putting in animation? Are you doing a reenactment? All of those choices, whose lens are we looking through? And what do they think about their subject? Why did they choose this person? Or why do they choose to tell this story about this particular group of people, whether it's fiction, you know, or this time and place? Uh, and I find the same faults both in fiction and in, and in nonfiction when it's somebody who is not doing this with any care or love. It's like they make all the same mistakes, regardless of whether it's a documentary or not. Uh, and it's alienating 
regardless whether I'm watching a fiction or nonfiction. So to me, it's just who is, who's holding the camera? Who's the crew? Why are they there? You bring up a really interesting point and it's um, in terms of fiction, are we married to the idea that the story has to be told correctly, that it has to be true, that it has to be truthful, um, or well, where do ethics um, come in when we talk about fiction filmmaking and we're we're also discussing a social issue? Um, is the onus on the audience member knowing that this is fiction, or is the creator as the creator do you have a responsibility to be honest or to not um, inflict, you know, pain onto, you know, your audience or the, you know, the people who are portrayed in, in your, in your piece. What do you think about fiction? Do we have a responsibility to be honest? Uh, my feeling has throughout the project that I've been working on and, and anything else that I do, even with my work as a composer or a musician is, um, it's interesting that you use the word honest. I tend to think of the word authentic and authentic from the perspective of the, the things that I know or the things that um, have been shared and have been, you know, been given permission to share. And I think that authenticity comes through when you're able to uh, digest it through whatever process that you have as a as a creator, whether that's through your writing process or that's through your image process or that's through, in, in my case, very often through my sonic process. And so the the thing that I find that's valuable and really important is the 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 authenticity of the story. It, as 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 it relates to the material and what's there, and I'm sorry I'm speaking in very vague terms, but I think that um, like uh, one example is I recently you know I've been doing this these this research for this project this film Alex the Labyrinth, and I've been working with kids and like we're doing a scene and asking students to kind of design. Um, some things based on the based on this particular scene and designing characters that we might want to use for this um, animated short that's like a docu uh, animated docu short and um, and we're talking about pandemic and we're talking about um, COVID-19 and I think very often um, youth uh, especially in the world in, in the nonprofit world that I work in I've really become protective where I don't want to I'm not asking children to give me their trauma I'm not asking children to like tell me a sad story about oh how did COVID-19 affect your life or how did the pandemic affect your life you know I'm just asking for their perspective and their creativity and their their to them to be themselves because it, it might just be whatever that is and and taking that and digesting it and trying to represent that in the most authentic way in, in, in how we how we then take that information, how we take those stories and then put them out there. Um, and the, the kids created, some of them created like superhero characters that might have represented their emotional state at the time. And they're using character design as a way to um, showcase their emotional uh, place or their emotional, um, uh, what, I what I usually call their emotional uh, language. So uh, that's that to me, like representing that authentically, even in something that is fictional and you know, in, and based in something real. I I think it's I think it's important to be authentic. I think that um, this is this is a very interesting subject because uh, I think most artists go into art making with good intentions. Um, I tend to go into art making just to entertain people. And, I, you know, I think about, all, not that I think about all the other stuff afterwards, but I try to, you know, before a wider audience experiences the art, I try and show it to people in my circle who I trust, who can be honest with me, um, because I could 
make a mistake and I don't even know that I'm making a mistake, you know? And so, you know, this is interesting because, you know, Daniel mentions that he doesn't want to bring somebody's trauma out, but, you know, it might be that trauma that other people connect to, you know, so that because I feel as though, you know, there are a lot of times where I'm like, man, I wonder if that person's going through the same thing I'm going through because it's difficult what I'm going through. And I, I really don't want to face this alone. And, you know, then then you experience and you see somebody on screen um, speaking exactly about what you're feeling and like just making that connection. I'm not saying that like, you know, I feel better, you know, for, you know, in spite of that other person, but, you know, it's it's a way to connect so that we know that we're not on this rock all alone so you know there's definitely a, a fine line and, and I think if you're if, if you're trying first of all you're going to make mistakes that's going to happen all right whether you have good intentions or not but if you are truly you know investigating um your themes and what you're trying to say in an honest or authentic way um you know I think people people would be able and should be able to see that and trust you with whatever material you are getting out of them, whatever back and forth you're having. So, you know, it's hard for me to, to have a definite answer about this because it can change from minute to minute and from piece to piece. Yeah, I did. Um... Yeah, I um, I think a, a big thing that um, I'm always exploring and trying to communicate with other creators is that there is like, there's responsibility on both sides of the creator and then the consumer of the media of, you know, how we're, we're going into and acknowledging that media has this impact on us, right? So like, you know, demanding more from our media too, like de demanding that representation that Wimoto was talking about, like even just that um, is a part of like that authenticity, right? Is like <laughs> holding people accountable for for who's telling these stories and, and how they're being told as well, right? Like thinking critically um, about the people that are appearing on screen, thinking about the experiences that they're sharing, no matter like what the, the medium or, or, or genre is, um, I think that comes into it, but there, there is like, I, ethics, <laughs> it's like, I, like people genuinely are like, usually you're trying to do something good. Right. And, and like I said, intentions are usually good. Right. Um, that doesn't always mean that our impact ends up that way. And that's when like accountability comes into it, where you can say like, oh, okay, like my lens, my experience influenced this, I can learn now, right? Like we, we can now adjust that and, and grow from those experiences. And I think that's a, a beautiful part of creating is getting that feedback and hearing from like different people and getting to learn just like how involved in our own little bubbles we often are. Um, but I think there is like, when we create, we're putting something out there with the intention of connecting to and sharing and, and no matter what that share is, it could be an opportunity to educate, it could be an opportunity to just to make someone laugh, right? like any of it um, is going to have some type of connection with our audience. And so just being really intentional about those connections and knowing what you're, you're setting out to do is really important. And I also think like our, our audiences are pretty smart. <laughs> like we need to give them a little more credit. Like they, they generally can fill in those gaps and they can, you know, make connections there. Um, but sometimes like you don't want it to seem like you're, you're, you know, trying to pull a fast one, I guess. Like my, what I'm thinking of primarily is like, I've, I've been on the black hole of the internet about that uh, Marilyn Monroe film, film, <laughs> which is based on a book, which is fictional not based on her life and just like the film itself was just this really gross like just abuse of this person who can't defend herself and so many people don't know that that's a work of fiction and so many people aren't like oh it's based on a book like books could be nonfiction. like <laughs> just saying it's based on a book does not help so like there's some of that but also like 
even if you know it's fiction, it's still like this whole conversation of like, who gives them the right to, you know, take this person's life and twist it and turn it and, and continually abuse her, even though she's not here and rewrite her entire history and just continue to objectify her, like, despite her entire life trying to fight against that. So it's like, <laughs> things like that is what, what my brain gets kind of spiraled out into when it comes to ethics, or I'm just like, you can't just say it's fiction, <laughs> therefore I could do whatever I want. Because when you create, it does impact people and it has an influence on them and their understanding of others and how even they see themselves. And so it really comes all the way back to, to media literacy and just really looking into what you're watching and consuming and creating and knowing that when you create, your, you are putting something out there that's going to affect people and just being conscious of that, I think. Gabe said a really interesting word, which was connection. Connection and impact. Uh, and I think focusing on those words and sort of moving away from ethics and truth, because I'm, I mean, I work in fiction, I have zero interest in the truth at all. Like I, I could care less about it. And most of the stuff I do, I'm not, I'm not telling the truth. I made it up <laughs> and it's a totally different world in which like gravity doesn't even operate the same way. So it's not honest um, or it's not the truth as we know it right now. But I think that those, that, the, that space of like ethics is gets really dangerous because there was what is ethical again is defined by who and what is truth is defined by who. There's so many ethics and truth that were accepted even just last year that now all of us are like, oops, I don't know why I thought that was a good idea. Uh, so that's a moving target. And I don't know if an artist really should be concerned with that because artists are always of their time and in their time. So I'm not really sure that's like a thing you can like rest your arts practice on when it's constantly changing minute by minute by minute as new information hits hits your eyeballs. Um, but connection is constant. We wanna connect. We are inherently beings that need to connect to survive, we need each other. So that like, who are you trying to connect to and why? I think is one is a thing you can like really hang your hat on. And then impact, what impact? You can't really guess it, but you can say like, well, this is what I hope the impact would be. And then brace yourself for the fact that maybe that won't happen and you'll be considered a villain. But at the very least, you can you can say, this is what I was saying. You gotta be ready to stand over it is what I'm saying. Like, you gotta be ready to like get in front of the firing squad and be like, yeah, but I said what I said, die mad. You know, like sometimes that's what it has to be especially because who is telling the truth and what the truth is and who is ethical and who is villainized is a deeply political conversation. Uh, the changes from state to state or like what part of the city you happen to be living in, you know? So I can't, I can't really go by that. But I do, I think um, the role of ethics though in truth plays a part in the creative process. And by that, I mean like, when you start getting collaborators, how do you treat people while you're making something? How do you treat them? How are you treating each other while you're making it? Uh, and I think that is where you can really start thinking about ethics. What is ethical treatment of my collaborators? And you know, sit down together and define what that is for your group or your whoever it is, that you, whatever partnership you're doing right now. Uh, and I think that, is a way to kind of diffuse this things, these kerfuffles that can happen after that. Because uh, one thing I do pick up on is when somebody is wanting to like engage in like an extraction, like they reach out to me with whatever it is they're making and they clearly want to extract something from me. And I think audience people, audience members, the community, witnesses, whatever you want to call them, they know that when that's happening. So, and probably that had something to do with the way you made the thing too. It was extractive from you know the ground up. So one way maybe to go about this and rather than thinking like, is this thing we're telling the truth? Is this art we're making truthful or is it ethical? Like, did we treat each other ethically? Were we honest with each other when we did this? And I feel like that will have a domino effect. 
but it does come back to connection, like connection to the people you're making it with. So to piggyback off of that, um, when do you, how do you determine which genre you're going to use, you know, to tell a particular story? Uh, you know, once you figure out the, you know, the themes and the things you want to say, do you just go immediately to one particular genre or do you think, you know what, this will work better in this other genre? Is that for everybody or are you just asking me? <laughs> that's that's for everybody, sorry. <laughs> Daniel, you wanna jump in? Oh yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I was just thinking about it. I, uh, I tend to, um, I've always lived my life in a fantasy of my own making and that's just where I am. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's uh, in queer culture, you know, we have, you know, like, you know, live the fantasy and this kind of uh, idea. Um, actually, speaking of documentaries, one of my favorite documentaries, which, you know, has its own, um, you know, it's, it, you know, a, as it's aged, people have had many questions about it, but Jenny Livingston's um, Paris is Burning. Uh, so I I feel like the, for me, in, in terms of genre, I'm always, um, I don't want to say the word uh, 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 romanticizing, but I tend to um, take the things that are uh, part of like the research and it then it's interpreted through through a different lens. And so in a lot of my work that is non non film or, or non video it tends to be about um, taking taking something and then trying to find the emotional piece of it that's really stirring and really um, interesting and kind of exploring that. Um, so I did um, I did an, an album that was about uh, the life of the mother, and I'm, I'm sorry, um, Teresa of Avila, who um, is a venerated saint. We just celebrated um, her day was on October 15th. And uh, in her book, The Life, and also her her mystic writing. And so, you know, the album wasn't taking the text from anything that she had created. It was inspired by. And so it's just more, for me, like always leaning towards fiction because I feel like fiction tends to, um, I'm interested in like the, like the, the core elemental piece of, of the story that I'm telling, which for me tends to be like the very strong emotional um, feelings of, of of what's there, or or the or the thing that's that 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 would that stirs that stirs me, and that's what I want to share, rather than being very like linear. And I like things to be more like in different different levels, different places, and um, I'm discovering that. Um, in in film and in this animated piece that we're working on that that's possible too like we don't have to be um, just linear that we can have different parts that um, utilizes the the magic of storytelling and fictional storytelling to um, make an experience like you know and I feel like documentaries can definitely give you an experience I feel like I mean I love watching you know, Sister Wendy Beckett, you know, go through a museum and talk about a painting. Or I love watching, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, watching, you know, the, the you know, somebody traveling and trying food for the first time. And, you know, all of those, those things are really amazing. And I feel like that kind of storytelling is really valuable and also really insightful. But I like, I like the piece of it when they're tasting the thing or they're relishing in it. That's what I want. I want that feeling. And I feel like fiction, I always lean towards fiction to like, like take me to that place. Awesome. Yeah. I, um, I like things that, uh, are fun <laughs> like I like to have fun um and so sometimes that's that's a part of it is I get this like crazy idea or um this way to uh 
describe or explore maybe like a traumatic or just upsetting experience and I'm like but how could I do this that's like digestible and not just like here's trauma like in your face um and I think I've often found that obviously from my entire brand that horror is really like a a, a place for that um it, it gets a bad rap for <laughs> you know the 500 Halloween films that there are now um and just having like the same cliche films that we're we're so used to seeing but um there's an entire world of horror that just gets really underrated um and I get really frustrated by that because I think like there's a power in the fact that it's like this fringe genre that's not as like like patrolled <laughs> like monitored as all the other genres out there where it could like get away with more and people will stumble upon it and be like whoa this is saying something um which is why I think the term elevated horror grinds on anybody who <laughs> is just existing in this sphere uh it grinds on our nerves because it's like it's it's always been elevated and also like that's just like media like look at media critically for a minute um <laughs> so I get really sassy about those things but um I just find there's like a um accessibility in horror too that you can't find in a lot of places like comedy can be really hard to write because not everybody thinks the things that you think are funny like it's it's hard to find this universal like uh, comedy piece. Uh, drama can get really like cheesy really quick. Um, <laughs> action and, and suspense and thriller and those things can, you really have to um, like work up to to that tension in a, in a different way. Whereas like with <laughs> horror, like you could just take some friends out back film this like short thing of this like let's I'm like living for your whole experience of you creating your film because I'm like that's exactly what it's like for me too it's just like grab camera do this thing we're gonna figure it out as we go and it, it is really exciting um and every time it's like this new challenge uh and so it does tend to be like when I'm envisioning um <laughs> my worlds like I have like horror um or fantasy or just like post-apocalyptic <laughs> and they're always like these you know bigger explorations of just like humanity and these like like connectivity and uh community aspects but it's done in this like absurd crazy way that you can only really get with a good horror film where you're just like whoa <laughs> like what am I doing here um and so that those are what I gravitate towards but I'd say like consuming media like I'm I just like always in awe of people who can create these stories in these genres where I was like I never thought I would enjoy fantasy quite this way <laughs> you know like you, you you grow up where people are like fantasy is J.R.R. Tolkien and then just this and I was like this is kind of boring and then you know you discover N.K. Jemisin and I'm like whoa horror like a fantasy could be like this like who knew um and I think that's really exciting is to to see these voices and and I really appreciate people who can have the patience to create all those worlds and, and really get in depth in those things and um they don't always get enough credit <laughs> again the same way that um people who genuinely like spend years making documentaries all the power to you for for the patience and being able to cycle through all that footage and discover your story and all of that absolutely um but we also got to give credit to all these people who are creating entire worlds like the the, the laws like Rimoto was saying don't exist we make them up and so we got to give some credit to to those folks too because their brains are working in overdrive as well um and I think I answered the question <laughs> also trying to like slow down I'm a very fast talker so I apologize to our interpreter <laughs> thank you Gabe Wimoto yes uh and yes sorry to Lena if I'm speaking fast as well um I'm you know I'm always you working in horror sci-fi so it's not really so much the genre for me as the discipline that I sit and will my that sometimes I'll start in one and then be like actually no so lately I am also trying to not do that like trying to make that decision beforehand um and say like well if this is a short film why like why are you using the medium of film to tell the story why isn't this 
a short story? Why isn't this a radio play? Why isn't this a play? Why isn't this just like an Instagram post? Like there's just so many ways that you can communicate an idea. It's like, or is it like, do you really need to do all this for this one idea? Or is it just like, can you whittle it down to a meme? You know, like, because you're going to pour so much of yourself into it, it's going to be so much of your time and energy. So it's like, okay, and why does it need to be in this medium? And what is it about this medium that will help me, you know, go in deep and have all the fun that I want to have <laughs> with it? Um, and sometimes that's, you know, like spirit tells you, all right, it's like, it has to be this. And sometimes that's just like money. I can't afford to do this. So I'm going to do that. And that's really what determines which one, it, which bucket it falls into. Are you saying that a lot of filmmakers are just basically making memes because they don't have any money? Just I mean, kidding. I think a lot just of kidding. really great. No, I actually want to answer that. I think there's a lot of really great storytelling in social media because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. And I think if they weren't behind a paywall, it'd be interesting to see what, what would happen with some of these folks that like, if they, because film is behind a paywall, it is. So, I mean, what, what happened? What happened with that? What happened was like, now we have all these influencers, but maybe if they had just had access to be filmmakers, <laughs> you know, but like, here they are because that was that was what was accessible and you know now that's a job you I, i'm going to jump in here with a question that i actually that we had and it's it's a great segue it's it's as you know as technology um becomes more accessible becomes cheaper and more people are able to tell their stories. What do you anticipate happening in the landscape, both in fiction and nonfiction? Do you think that we're going to live in this world of just like two minute, you know, uh, films? Are we are we getting used to consuming things that are very short? Um, you know, is is our is our attention span? Are, are we training our attention span to to um, to appreciate and digest a different format? What are you guys afraid of, um, or is it exciting to you? Um, kind of like this bite-sized, everyone has access to tell their stories and what, you know, what does that look like? Well, I, I feel like it's um, the opportunities for storytelling are diversifying personally um, because I feel like feature films get longer and longer and longer and we still go to the movie theater and we still watch them. And uh, memes and uh, little stories from the dodo and uh, these kinds of, you know, animal rescue stories and then, you know, art making stories and um, uh, videos of, of people making or trying different things or commenting on someone's, you know, cooking, whether good or bad. Um, I feel like all of these are incredibly new avenues of connection and storytelling that um, have the opportunity to be quick, accessible, and or just, you know, incredibly, incredible masterpieces. Um, I, again, art history nerd, I'm always thinking about, um, you know, like, we lived through uh, a moment of, uh, of art where there was this desire to create these grand, I feel like, you know, the, the, the Grand Academy of French painting, those people would have been filmmakers today. You know, they would have been making the next Marvel movie. So these are people who are composing these huge works on canvas with a whole team of people to create this incredible battle scene. And then the Impressionists come along and the Impressionists make these pieces that are all focused on light and simple daily life. And they're quickly made and they're made in like a day or two and we treasure Cezanne we treasure Renoir and I think that that's what we're living in right now I think we're in the impressionist period of media um and I think that it's really diversifying and it's really interesting I love hey, that. Daniel <laughs> what what did the like because I look at it in terms of the audience so you know is that what the audience wanted back then? Like these gigantic 
marvel style paintings because I, I feel as though like from what i am experiencing i think the audience has more power now like you know back in the day uh you know you just had movies you didn't have tv there was a time when there was no tv it was just movies and that's all people had right or radio shows but now there's so much stuff that people can choose from and everybody talks about like oh everybody's attention span is getting shorter but like again movies are getting longer there's yeah there's we're binging tv programs. shows yeah, we're binging tv shows so i think it's like the audience is deciding like I don't know if like what's good is the way to put it, but they are deciding what they want to put in front of their eyes versus before like the choices were limited. So uh, what you described, would you say like the audience had limited choices back then? Because you're saying that you're comparing it to to today. So that's why I'm interested to because I don't know much about that period. Well, um, the the annual salon was this huge show that people had the opportunity to see and it was the only t it was the one major public exhibition that was available and it was the one place where if you were an artist or a painter a sculptor a printmaker you needed to get into this exhibition to be seen and the Impressionists lived outside of that. And they even created their own space, their own schools, their own exhibitions. And even though they only put on eight exhibitions, they changed the world. They created a whole new space for consuming art and thinking about the way that we see the world in a different way. I mean, pointillism is how we look at our screens now. Our screens are little tiny dots of many things. And they were, and so science had a play in it, new theories, philosophy, all these different things. You know, if you want to talk about abstract art, theosophy, um, just so all of these different elements come together. And I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I think the audience did make a determination, but I think it's also people who, again, you know, I think what, um, Wimoto was talking about was this paywall, you know, and so that's true. I mean, there's uh, when things become institutionalized, then then we break them, and I think that's just um, a cycle that just happens again and again. But I like to think of the social media and this kind of storytelling and this very immediate, colorful, not not polished kind of um, media making as I think. As the as the era of impressionism, but in media. I also want to just note that, like you know, artists are in the audience. <laughs> like you're not separate from it. You're in people's audience. You were, you know, before you step forward and say, "Hey, look at my thing," uh, you were in somebody's audience. Um, you're in, you know, you do it now. You go to other people's things. So, you know, did you did you want something else? And you know, you had a part in that in wanting access in wanting to see longer movie, you, you know, that was that is like that this is a it's a relationship. Um, they're getting longer because we asked that they're getting longer because this person wants to make it longer because we like that it's longer like you know I don't know it's our attention pans are sh our attention spans are shorter because we want that because what you know it's all there's like lots of different variables I mean think of why you want to watch something for only one minute you know what is it and that's probably what everybody else the same reasons that everybody else wants to watch something for one minute um so i don't know whether it's good or bad i don't know i think the work that uh gabe and folks like gabe are doing when they're talking about media literacy that's the thing that i'm afraid of not all the different forms of storytelling and diversifying, whether it's good or bad, it's kind of like, eh, you know, you can make an argument for both cases, but without the media literacy, without people really understanding what it is that they're looking at, you know, we're, we have more information than we've that. This is different from the time that you're speaking of Daniel with the impressionist painting is the, the uh, access to information has increased exponentially. And it is historic. Like, people have never been able to know the way we can know uh, folks that we've never even, may never even encounter in our daily lives where they can be like, 
inside of our head if we listen to their podcast, right? So do, are we ready for that? Like, are we ready to like input that much data? Do we understand, do we have the like critical thinking skills, skills to contextualize all these different experiences? Yeah, do we have the media literacy or, or is it just kind of like amorphous blobs in front of your face, in which case it, it kind of doesn't even matter whether the work is good or bad or whether it's long or short. Uh, yeah, but, I, 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 I think that we, um, I think that we have a, a capacity. I think it's mm, context and how we choose to consume things. And I don't know, I, I, I think we're gonna find out, you know, because I don't think it's gonna stop and we're gonna, we're gonna see how, how it works. I do take like breaks personally it just as someone like myself I just think I'm sensitive to these things but I will do the thing of like okay time for a break from my device and I just literally put it away so I think that maybe some of us will um, suffer from fatigue and I even wear glasses now for looking at screens because I get headaches and it hurts you know and so I have to wear blue light protection glasses and so I think we'll find out like how much media we can consume and how it affects us, how it affects our brain, our processes. And, but you're, you're right. Like we're, we're bombarded by images. We see more images every day than people did maybe 50 years ago. Um, way more images. And I think we're learning how it, how it affects us. And I think we're learning how it um, changes our, our own um, perception of the world and, and maybe, maybe even our own DNA. Um, Daniel, you're so strong to put your device down. <laughs> like, whoa, you can do that? No. Um, yeah, I, I have like so many thoughts. Uh, one just super resonating with everything that everyone's saying here and uh love the this like idea of like the different styles of painting. I was like, oh my god. So um for me, there there's a bit of excitement that comes from the accessibility. Um I don't know if I'll say anything about like attention span because like I can spend you know a long time digesting these amazing short films on TikTok like two minute films one 30 second films where I'm like whoa how did you do that that is amazing and then I could also sit through like an hour and a half of an episode of a k-drama and be like okay I could dedicate you know an entire day <laughs> to watching half of this uh k-drama series um and so and also like movies are getting longer uh like does this does Batman have to be three hours uh I guess so um <laughs> but I think like a big part of um, like me as an educator, when I am, you know, teaching folks about like, you know, how to get their affairs in order, to, in order to create. And um, one of my biggest things is just asking the question of like, how much time do you need to tell this story? Like how much time does it make sense for? And I think the fact that we have this like diversity of media now, so you can make a 30 second TikTok or you can make an hour and a half episode of a K-drama um, and anything in between really opens up this opportunity to uh, kind of loosen those rules that we were so restricted to, you know, like it was like you either made a feature film and you had to fill time with whatever um, that maybe wasn't necessary to the plot. Um, but now we can, you know, cut those down and just tell the story that we we feel like we need to tell or fits in the time and so it kind of I really appreciate when people acknowledge that um there's also this whole aspect of like the technology growing and that also really excites me <laughs> because it becomes more accessible I think one of the the silver linings for this pandemic has been the accessibility like the fact that we can have this conversation we're all in different places we have an interpreter we can have closed captioning like people can use their amazing devices that are super small to record things that are happening in their communities or to tell a story and in this very unique way um through this lens that like we had never considered and that really like inspires me <laughs> for things because i get really just like super nerding out when I see something where I'm just like, wow, I can't believe your brain was able to create that. That happens with anything, but I just get really, really excited with the 
the opportunities that we have as creators um, that the, some of the restrictions that we used to have just aren't there. And there's, you know, a bit of, of loosening in that. And even so, like, there are just times when, like, I was just at a film festival and there was a feature film and I was like, this did not need to be a feature film, <laughs> um, where they were clearly just trying to hit that number. And I was like, that's lovely. I'm so happy for you. But like, this could have been like three different movies and I would have liked it significantly more whereas there's like other stories where I was like wait what happens <laughs> like I need more to that um and so it really just I think boils down to you understanding what your message is and what your story is and the way that you want to tell it and make sure you give yourself enough time and not too much time which is like a trick for you <laughs> so it's like what is that game and I'm like whatever it is um so yeah, there, that's <laughs> my roundabout thing uh, to say that I think TikTok is cool. Uh, it's also scary. There's a lot of scary things on there, but it's also really interesting because there's some, you know, there's news and information and uh, situations that I'm getting information on that I wouldn't have been able to do, you know, or people weren't able to do 50 years ago. So we do have that broken down barrier of, of accessibility to information. Um, but you're always only going to get the information that the internet thinks you want. <laughs> so just open up and make sure the internet knows the information that you want and, uh, you know, work those algorithms and make something, make anything, uh, <laughs> make, make it all in, make in it all. any way that you want. <laughs> so we, we have a question, but before we get to Kareem's question, I want to just because we're uh, Gabe, you gave us a really good point to segue into this is for anyone, for our audience, anyone listening who wants to create a work of fiction, if you had your top three things where you need to get in order, uh, in order to just go for it and, and create your own story, what are the top three tools or advice that you would give a new filmmaker, a new fiction filmmaker? Danny, you want to go first? Um, <clears throat> Doesn't have to be three, but. Well, I mean, uh, for me, it's a story, 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 really. And that, how you make that, like, I think it's worth taking the time that you need, you know, to really strengthen it. Um, but yeah, the story is, is everything. Um, and the way that it's told and if it's if it's if it can be um you know really uh done in a way i think that makes you feel very satisfied personally then i i think yeah i think that's the that's the piece that's that's really important i i'm personally like i'm never satisfied i can like rework something as much and, and keep going but um sometimes i just have to trust my gut or uh, trust the deadline. <laughs> yes, a deadline. <laughs> That's a big one in some ways. Um, if I were speaking to my younger self, I I'm gonna I'm gonna do it that way. Um, I would say, uh, do not worry about your camera or whatever you're using to film yourself. Um, but do worry about your sound because that is more important than your image. You'd be so surprised how important that is. And um, you know what? I'm just gonna keep it, I'm just gonna keep it technical to technical things. And the third thing would be lighting. Think about your lighting deeply. So screw whatever you're using to film with, make sure you have good audio, and then think deeply about how that crappy camera or whatever you're using is going to capture light and then you'll be fine. That's awesome. Um, yeah, generally when, I, when I'm uh, instructing folks, uh, one is, is I really want to always explain like how much work goes into filmmaking and creating media. Like there, it like, yeah, you can pick up your phone, but you're, you're putting in this effort, right? You have to be really passionate about something. Like no one's just like, oh, I guess I'll just spend like half a year developing a script and getting people to read it and then finding the crew and then finding the cast and then getting the equipment. Like that's not a casual thing. <laughs> so make sure it's something that you're, you're passionate about. Cause that's also going to come through, um, 
which is which is the second thing that I always like to put in there is that um, especially as you know someone who works for community access it, it's really important to acknowledge who you are and why you're creating it and in the lens in which that you are looking through to create this because that's really going to have an effect on our work even if we're you know making a documentary film it's like why you why are you the one who's telling this story what are you bringing with you to this story um because that really is what builds it and makes it into this unique piece that like if you know me and we mojo have the same idea it is not going to look the same <laughs> we're very different people like we're going to come in there might be similarities but there's going to be this whole lens um that will change it and, and as long as it's not this like lukewarm nothing message like <laughs> sometimes we see in Hollywood where it's like that's a nothing film like <laughs> that has no heart in it um generally when we're creating we have to care about it um and then the the last piece uh, of advice is always just to do it afraid um I can't tell you how many times I have to like shake people <laughs> into creating content um because they're waiting for it to be perfect or they're waiting for everything to fall into place or they're waiting for this one thing and it's just like no <laughs> you just got to jump in do it figure it out as you go because you're only going to learn by doing it and that's how you kind of you you make that first thing and you're like wow okay that was terrible like <laughs> next time I'm going to make sure someone is dedicated to sound uh because you can't explain away bad sound it's just terrible whereas you can explain away like underlining or like if it's overexposed like that's just like the message of the film is that aren't we all overexposed um but if the audio is distorted that's it <laughs> right so um do it afraid get out there make something uh that you you're going to be excited that you did and you took that time to do um, and just, you know, respecting and appreciating that it is going to take time um, and giving yourself that time. And I think then you can do anything. Anything is possible. Um, I guess I would say filmmaking is a collaborative process. It's really hard to do it alone. So find your tribe. Find your tribe and have fun. Uh, just remember, it's supposed to be fun. <laughs> it's make believe, it's play. Uh, so if you find yourself not having fun, stop. And figure out how to get back to the fun. Also, uh, take everyone's advice with a grain of salt, even all the words that just came out of my mouth. Because I'm not you and whatever it is that you're doing. And at the end of the day, I don't really know. Like there's no one way to do this. Uh, so yeah, you can take what I said and all what all of us said, it's all valid advice, but you should also completely ignore all of it, <laughs> except for the technical thing about the sound that is actually absolutely- I was just about to say that. <laughs> No, except for less. Less, you it's should listen to him. But the rest of us, you can kind of be like, eh. but like the sound and the light, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just think about how people complain about those Game of Thrones shows. They get all that money and all anybody could be like is I can't see it. So yeah, I mean, you know, there's certain things where it's, that's absolutely the truth, but everything else, yeah, and it's kind of particular to your experience. I, I find it's just, you know, you go farther together. Thank you guys. Kareem, do you want me to read your, your uh, question or would you like to come up and read it? Oh, I'd be happy to. Oh, please um, do. So, uh, I, and, and this is coming from someone who has dabbled in this area. And so it's, it's approaching topics. Like for example, I, I've done a lot to do with mental illness and all of that, but there, when it's an injustice, there is always the other side, right? That um, sometimes you'll get people fired up when they see your work or hear your work because, well, you're only showing that one side of the problem. So how would, how, how, if, if you've tackled something like this, how did you do that in a way that, um, with, with that in mind, we'll say that. I mean, I don't ever do like method any anything that's really around a, a particular injustice, um, or you could argue that all of my stuff is around it. You know, it's, I I'm pretty vague. I like 
am pretty, I keep a strong poker face about like, what did I really mean by certain things in, in my horror storytelling? Um, but I do know that just in general, in storytelling, it is fun to create a protagonist that is flawed. It is fun for me, <laughs> my little like macabre <laughs> imaginings to have other characters argue with my protagonist and, and, and question her and, and make you see another side and make you think like, maybe she's wrong. Um, so I'm for presenting, I think it's like, if you are doing something in particular, like, okay, around mental illness or around uh, homelessness, let's say I'm making something about homelessness. Um, what is it that you are in investigating in the work? Is it, is it, uh, if it's nonfiction, it, is this meant your impact? Would you want the impact to be restorative? Are, are you trying to get people to debate things? Like for me, if it was a nonfiction work about homelessness, I would also be thinking about what happens after the movie is done. Am I having a Q&A, a facilitator, and we're going to be talking, I want like action steps. It's kind of like, what are my desires here? Um, but if it's fiction, I don't really care about the, then I really just care about this person that I've created and their story and what, and I, you know, every story, every character that I create, whether, whether they're good or bad, you know, I love them. So, <laughs> because they came from my imagination, I'm very protective of them. So it would really be more about, you know, choices around that and less about what you were, you know, I think what you're getting at here. So, but if it's nonfiction, I do think that it's like, it really is the like, what is the impact? What do the lights come up on my film and what is it that I think is supposed to be happening? Right. Just to add to, to what Rimoto was saying, I think that because if you're going with fiction, one of the things that you can do is make the opposing argument the thing that hinders and forces your character to arc. So it's 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 part of your story. So if you're throwing bricks at your at your you know your protagonist and they're dodging it, they're dodging it with their um, their point of view. So even if your point of view is one way and your opposing is another way, that is your conflict. So you can always have some level of conflict in your story that sheds light on the argument that you're opposing or the argument that, that you just want to um, shed light on so that people can talk about it. Because ultimately you want your art to open people up to a different world and you're successful if you do that. So presenting the arguments, that's the least of your worries. Focus on your journey, your character, making it a kick butt story and all of the things that, that, that are opposing, throw it in there as, as, you know, as character development. Don't I, hide it. I always feel like it, um, maybe it's about empathy. Like you empathize with that character that you've created and you want the audience to empathize with that character and to understand how it has affected them. But um, I feel too like um, like that would be you know completely what you know what's what Eunice is talking about in terms of fiction. Um, I've seen some documentaries where you know I was in close proximity to the to the actual events, and I just thought, oh, that's so interesting that they left out so much stuff that I remember reading about in the newspaper, or. Um, oh, this is a very like narrow perspective. This is a very specific perspective. And there's all these other things that were not, you know, mentioned in, in this documentary. And so I think that even there, um, I could understand the filmmaker wanted me to watch and empathize with their, their, their situation and wanted me to agree with them. And they were, they were, they were giving their case. It was almost like they were presenting a, like a, like a court, like, like a case for their, their side. And so I think that's probably uh, one of several ways that you can um, show that. But in terms of like both sides, you know, like I'm going to make a film that shows both sides of the argument. I don't even know if that's possible. Mm -hmm. I really don't think so because we're people with a uh, perspective and experience and we only know what we know. And um, I, I think it's hard to make a film that's only what you see and what you hear and you know so but um yeah like i think that's 
without uh, with with all the vagueness I've just spoken. Um, that's well, as I close as it. I can get. <laughs> it, 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 it loses authenticity when you try and represent everything. It's sometimes it's just if you're going to go through that perspective, then just give it all to that perspective sometimes, but or or use the other one to build that tension sometimes. I can understand that right. as well. Yeah. It's your voice, right? This is all yeah. about your voice. Who cares what other people are talk, you know, are thinking of? Mm. You're making your art to express you. That's it. And, and, and just be authentic, as, as Daniel was saying earlier, be authentic. That is your truth. That's mm. it. You, you cannot try to tell multiple sides. It's just too much. And it's not your responsibility. Your voice is singular. Well, you know, within you. I, I hope I'm not using a really bad example and I'm going like somewhere crazy with this, but I feel as though for me, like a good example of presenting both sides and being really captivated by both sides was Black Panther. Like I was so into the antagonist, you know, because like, I felt like what he was trying to do was noble. Now, you know, he was a murderer and all these things, but like, you know, I think when you, I don't know if we would say that that movie was presenting both sides, but it definitely, there was a lot in there that made it very captivating. Cause you know, we've seen so many movies where like the antagonist is like, I just want a million dollars, you know, or that kind of thing. Like, I'm thinking even, you know, I love the matrix, but like at the end of the day, it's like, you know, this is these machines are like, they're just, what are they trying to do? They're just trying to, you know, have batteries like okay whatever but something like black panther like it was to me it was a lot more captivating because i think they went there um in terms of like hey let's really think hard and deep about what this you know what this other character is is trying to do he's trying to you know he he's standing up for black folks you know so i don't know maybe a bad example but i think I think if you approach things, you know, from both sides, I, it can be a very effective tool for your storytelling. I just want to uh, note something that Debbie in the chat wrote, which is, are there ever only two sides? So just being mindful, like both sides, what does that mean? <laughs> both sides of what? Two sides, uh-huh. Um, and why, like, presenting the other side is like kind of you're never really going to do it so you, it's really more about presenting a another side <laughs> and then I think it also has to do like what is the genre that you're working in do you have time to present more than one other side uh is it two just by default due to like if not this this film is going to be four hours long um mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're writing a novel, I'm thinking of beloved Toni Morrison, there's three perspectives, depending on, and each chapter is a different, or Toni Arayemi's uh, Children of Blood and Bone and Virtue and Vengeance. You're getting multiple characters' perspectives. They're telling different parts of the story, sometimes, you know, the same event, uh, because they have a whole chapter, but she's got a whole novel to do that, you know, you can't do that in a documentary movie so <laughs> or in a film um so yeah I also think that has that has a lot maybe it's it might be helpful to be like what are the sides that I want to explore with this work yes oh go ahead Les. oh no go ahead <laughs> Um, yeah, lots, lots there. And I agree. I was also like both sides, <laughs> I was like what two sides. Um, but, uh, I've also, um, have often, uh, resonated with a, a villain in a story where I'm like, is their motivation really bad compared to some of the other villains we see? And sometimes I'm just like, oh no, <laughs> like, uh, but I think, uh, my biggest thing that I was saying that is, um, because, my program, we're always talking uh, and, and dissecting media and, and trying to figure out what point of view it is. And I think you really only have the obligation to tell your story or uh, stories that make sense to you. Like you shouldn't be telling other people's stories. And so I can't tell both sides because I don't exist on both sides, like, you know, of this. But I also think like when it comes to like in, injustice, as you're saying, um, that there 
when we're thinking of different sides, some of those sides often are uh, one side that is the the one that we're always hearing about, and the other side is like the the quieted or the underrepresented side. And so purely the existence of this media is already like you trying to like make up for the fact that we're we're not even being heard. Um, and so, no, we don't need to tell their side. They get all the time to tell their side all the time. <laughs> like it, it's, it's just us existing is being able to confront those issues um, and actually like make a dent in, in the, the psyche of that. Um, and then building on, uh, something that we might have said as well is one of the biggest things that we strive for is this idea of impact producing and the what happens after a film and as creatives like really thinking through that um, that depending on what it is that you want to leave your viewers with like do we want to leave them with just like a laugh um, or if we're creating a documentary right where we're motivating them we're educating them on an issue and maybe we're getting riled up they're getting upset or um, they're like wow I didn't know that was happening now what <laughs> they just see credits and then it's like okay, what do I do here, right? Um, and instead, if we're, you know, giving them actionable steps, next items of, of, okay, here are organizers in your community that are actively working to fix this issue, um, or here's how you, as like a regular person, can help, um, is, is a really powerful thing that I think creators just don't always understand. So I think uh, there isn't really, like, we, we've we've come across, like, in our discussions because we often are critiquing uh, like mainstream content and mainstream voices, I would say, um, where we're like, why are you doing this? Like, why are you telling this story? Why are you like, why is this person the one on the screen? And so we're often criticizing that and we have gotten comments before or just people like well-intentioned emailing, like you're always like complaining about this, this, and this. And it's like, yeah, because this is our experience. Um, and they, like, it is our duty to talk about those issues. <laughs> like the whole, our whole existence is to highlight these issues um, and uh, br like, you know, talk about these specific things from our lens. And so, yeah, they're gonna be that. <laughs> We're not gonna tell this other story. We're not gonna, you know, sympathize with these types of villains right. um, because that's just not our experience. And, and I don't think it helps either. And so I think, um, kind of back to, to what you're saying about working, like uh, talking about mental illness too, is um, who whose story are you telling? Are you telling like a caregiver story? Are you telling a person who is experiencing mental illness? Are you telling someone who's like just interacting with someone who has like, you really have to like in those ways, just commit to the, like the person that you're going to show and then like do that and don't try to half like tell somebody else's story in in conjunction with the main one and I think then you're going to be okay you just got to stick to to what your case is and you do not have an obligation to be telling everybody's business in your, in your content. I hope I hope that was helpful Kareem oh it thank was you. great I absolutely thank you this was this was a great panel thank you awesome I thank you so much for your question really appreciate it I, we are about to wrap up, but I want to make sure that I'm not missing any questions, any comments that, that you know, anyone has. Speak now. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Um, all right. So, Debbie, thank you so much for your comment. <laughs> um, I, I would think love to hear the first part of the um session that I missed was it recorded <laughs> it was recorded, recorded yeah. yes and you will have the opportunity to hear it from the top thank you thank you is so there also much. a place to, to see some of the work you've all done as well is certainly I'm curious and yeah to absolutely. know more yeah so so actually we have um if you go to Philly Cam's uh, page on Facebook and also, mm -hmm. I, I think actually across all social media, um, they have included a bio of everyone, all the panelists, so you can see our information there. So just go to the Philly Cam social media. Um, 
So I, just to wrap it up, we have, I know we have just one minute, but really quickly, I wanted to just get what everyone is working on next and where can we connect with you? Um, again, I know that Philly Cam has provided um, a bio information and, and, and just our links to websites. So that's there for everyone to, to find us. But really quickly, Daniel, you take it away. What is your next project? So uh, really quick, I'm working on a short animated film. I'm in pre-production. It's called Alex to the Labyrinth. I'm also writing music for an incredible project uh, that's called Trans Diaries. And that's a theater thing. And um, I released not that long ago, a new record called Sonetos de Amor Oscuro. And it's directly from the text of Federico Garcia Lorca. So you can go to my website, cello, C-E-L-L-O-E-Y-E. Dot com. I did put it in the chat, so check it out there. Um, so I'm stepping up and making a short film the same way I made my feature film, but this time I'm adding two actors and I'm going to have a cinematographer. <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm actually finally collaborating with other people. It's not going to be a woman band film. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, Gabe? Um, I am always creating uh, my show, The Ghouls Next Door. The horror media literacy show is weekly. So uh, we just had one come out yesterday about uh, uh, ghosts and grief and how you know losing someone haunts us um and we have a really uh, amazing things going on for for our haunted series so every every tuesday we have a new episode and you can catch us wherever you find podcasts and we're also in video form on youtube and spotify and we also like cut them up into clips and we have short films all of that um there's also i dropped in the chat just my personal website um but i've got you know i've got films always uh scripts waiting and begging me to <laughs> do it afraid all the time and they're like what are you doing um so yeah just check us out at goals we'll we'll be doing something there awesome. uh, i put my information in the chat of my website but you can get at me on instagram or twitter at dusky projects that's d-u-s-k-y as in kind of dark projects uh, right now, I am in pre-production for a horror comedy called Affordable Housing with somebody on this panel who is hosting. Her name is Eunice. She is the director. Uh, so we've received some funding and we are making a movie. And it is a, a short film about two women who fight a creature to the death to keep their cheap apartment. So slay monsters, save money. I'm also, we're also in the third season of Black Women Are Scary, which you can find anywhere you listen to podcasts was the wonderful sound design by Gabe Castro. Shout out. So, and that's like, yeah, all the podcasting things. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. And I, as, as we Moto said, I will be directing uh, her upcoming short film, Affordable Housing. I'm also, I have two films currently in the festival circuit. Um, Roll in the Star, this is actually premiering this Friday. I hope I, it's right, October 21st, 20th, um, at the Philadelphia um, Film Festival. And, um, and also on the 30th uh, at the Philadelphia Film Festival and then on October 28th at Urban World Film Festival. So I'm really excited. Thanks you guys. Thank you all so much for your time. Um, really just looking forward to seeing all your projects and um, everyone listening, please reach out to us. We are so happy to, um, to respond to anything or provide any additional information that you may need. Thank you. Thanks, Philly. Thank Cam. you.